we've now seen how that our uh, two market matching model always uh, admit the solution, that solution is unique. So we saw how we could figure out what product market and labor market tightness is where. Um, so, you know, we computed, a, I mean, we had a, a two by two system with two variable two equations and we rewrote it to, in a way that we could express um, product market tightness as an increasing function of labor market tightness and another decreasing function of labor market tightness. And so therefore we showed that um, these two functions had only one unique intersection and that gave us a unique solution to our model. Now we'll use this characterization of the solution of the model to uh, do a bunch of comparative statics. That is uh, to see how the model responds to different shocks. Um, so not only how the tightnesses respond to shocks, but also how all the other variables that are determined by the tightnesses respond. We'll start with aggregate demand shocks. Uh, and so we'll see how the model responds to uh, say a positive aggregate demand shock. All right, so let's compute, uh, let's look the, at the response of the, the model to a positive aggregate demand shock. So positive shock, it could be an increase uh, in the um, utility function parameter key, which means that households become a uh, value services more, so they, tend to, uh, they want to buy more services produced by firm. Uh, or we saw another, posit another positive aggregate dimension could be an increase in mu, the endowment of real wealth. When there's more real wealth in the economy, households uh, want to consume more. So exactly. These are the same type of shock that we had already studied in the basic model. Um, so how can we figure out uh, what happens? Well, we have to go back to um, the diagram that we use to find the solution of the model. And then we'll see how things move in that diagram because product and labor market tightness are jointly determined in that diagram. So we have to go back to that to see what happens. If you look at equation individually, um, you're not going to see anything because um, you know, it's a system, so everything is jointly determined. Just by staring at an equation, you'll just see like part of the story and you're not gonna be able to see um, the entire story. Um, and you know, that's a general lesson, like people always tell you stories in their micro model, looking at equation one at a time, and then they're going to tell a little story and stare at the equation, but because the system has to be solved jointly all the equations have to be solved jointly just looking at one equation is actually completely misleading uh, so you know which is why this obsession with um, staring at equations that a lot of micro people have is just silly you know if you don't have if you don't have a way to represent the entire system you're not going to see really um, anything um, so anyway and in fact the same you know this is a static system but the same is true when you have dynamic system just staring at one differential equation um, and telling story based on it. Like say you look at one Phillips curve, another equation telling story based on it is going to be completely misleading because the model is actually a set of differential equations. And so the only way to have the full picture would be to look at a phase diagram. Then you can actually see what happens. Um, so anyway, so I digress. Um, so here, let's look, at, uh, let's look at the model and let's look at how the model behave and what the solution is. So we had seen that, um, So we had seen that we could um, figure out the solution of the model. So we would have X, the product uh, market tightness, theta, the labor market tightness. And um, so we had two curves. Uh, we had the first curve like this. That was started at XM. Uh, and then that had an intercept here. And in fact, we said sometimes intercepts at infinity, so that this, this curve that we have here, in fact, so that curve we had called it XP because it was derived from a product market side equation, XP of theta. Um, sometimes it has actually a horizontal intercept. Um, 
So it means at that point, actually, the one with the intercept with the horizontal axis actually goes to infinity. Uh, okay, so anyway, we have something that looks like this, and then we had a second curve that was uh, upward sloping that looks something like this, and that was actually having a vertical asymptote. That curve, we had called it X L of theta, L because it was derived from labor market side equation. It would start at zero here. Uh, and this vertical asymptote was at a tightness level theta L that we had um, computed here. Uh, okay, and then the solutions of our, uh, you know, the solution of the model, therefore, is going to be here. So this is at one position. We have our labor market tightness and our product market tightness. So that's one solution. And indeed, it is um, it is going to be uh, unique. <clears throat> okay, so now the question is, uh, see what happens when we have an increase in either x or mu, uh, which is a positive aggregate dimension. So to see what happens, we, we need to know what are the expression for these uh, two curves, x, p, and x, l. So uh, this, I'm just reporting results from last time, xp of theta, we had said that, so let me pull out uh, this, so we had said that it was tau minus one, so the inverse of tau, the matching weight of the product market. And then we had the first term, t epsilon uh, mu, so this, you know, you'll have to go back to derivation uh, in, the, in the previous lectures, so here I'm just pulling out these results. WH, then we have 1 over F hat of theta, 1 over epsilon minus 1 minus 1. So this is our first equation for XP and then the XL of theta. And again, here I'm using the results from the previous lecture that was F minus 1, where F is a um, selling probability. And then we had W over P, the real wage. And then we had A, technology, alpha from the production function, H, one minus alpha, the size of the labor force, F hat of theta, the job finding probability, one minus alpha, one plus tau hat of theta, alpha, here we are. Okay, so these are our two equations that we've uh, represented here in the diagram. So what's going to happen in these two equations when we have a positive demand shock? Well, you can see whether it's an increase in x or mu, it's going to uh, have an effect here. So uh, either x or mu go up. So this whole term in the parenthesis in xp, it's going to go up. Um, and tau minus one is an tau is an increasing function of the matching wedge of tightness. So tau minus one, this is an increasing function in the same way that f minus one is an increasing function. Um, so if x epsilon mu goes up and tau minus one is increasing, so xp, you know, is going to be uh, the function xp is going to increase. The function xl is unaffected. Okay, because you can see there are no elements of aggregate demand in it. So, uh, what's going to happen here? Uh, so, XP, we, we said, is going to shift up, uh, and XL, uh, doesn't, XL doesn't move. So, basically, this curve here is going to shift like this. So this is what's going to happen when we have an increase in aggregate demand. We can see that the uh, XP curve moves, the uh, XL curve doesn't move. And so we can see immediately, well, this is very easy. Therefore, we know what's going to, uh, what's going to happen in the model. So we'll have a new solution of the model. In that solution, we'll have a new tightness that's higher on the labor market. And we'll also have a new tightness that's higher on the product market. So product market tightness goes up, labor market tightness goes up. Uh, great, so we can start summarizing our result. After an increase in aggregate demand, which is modeled by increase in key or increase in mu, 
what do we have? Well, labor market tightness, data goes up. Product market tightness, X goes up. All right, so that's, um, so we have you know, more aggregate demand. The product market tightness uh, goes up. So it means that suddenly firms are able to sell more of their production. Um, and, you know, we know what's going to happen if firms are able to sell more of their production. That's going to boost the labor demand. Do you remember that the labor demand was determined by the selling probability when firms can sell more of their stuff. They want more workers because they know that their workers are going to be uh, busier. They are going to be less idle. So that's going to boost the labor demand. And therefore, that's going to lead to a higher, uh, that's going to lead to a higher labor market tightness. So that's how these things propagate here. Um, so what do we know about the other variables? Well, employment, you know that employment is always on the labor supply. The labor supply, it's F hat of theta times H. Now, if theta goes up, the job finding probability goes up. H, the labor force participation doesn't change. Uh, and so we know that employment is going to increase here. Um, so we have higher labor market tightness, higher product market tightness, we have higher employment. Um, of course, on the side, given that the labor market tightness is higher, we know that the job finding probability is going to be higher. We know that for firms, the recruiting probability is going to fall. We know that the matching wage is going to increase. So if the recruiting probability goes down, firms have to spend more resources um, to recruit. So all of these things, you know, we can we, we know what's going to happen in the background. Similarly, if I know that the product market tightness goes up, I know that the selling probability is going to go up. I know that the buying probability is going to go down. So I know that the matching wage is going to increase. Um, so it's going to be harder for uh, people to buy stuff. Um, so all of this I know in the background. Um, okay, uh, employment goes up, so that's good. Um, okay, um, what happens to the number of producers? That's unclear because um, higher tightness means higher employment, but it also means a higher matching wage, so more, a bigger share of employment devoted to recruiting. And in fact, we'll show when we study efficiency that what happens to the number of producers is going to be uh, it's go going to be unclear here. Um, what happens to consumption similarly is going to be unclear uh, as we'll see later. So the last key variable that we haven't determined here is output. Uh, what happens to output? And so you could say, well, we know that output is directly determined on the aggregate demand. Um, so we know that. Uh, Output is on the aggregate demand. Here we know that uh, product market tightness has increased, so we would expect output to fall maybe. But of course, the aggregate demand has also shifted out because there was a positive aggregate demand shock. And so you have an aggregate demand that's further out, but then you're moving up your aggregate demand. So the two effects uh, go in opposite direction. So just by staring at the aggregate demand, you can't know what happens to output actually. And so to figure out what happens to output, we have to do a little bit of work um, we, we can't see it directly. Uh, we can't see it directly here. Um, so to figure out what happens to output, we need to recombine some of the equations that we already have to have an expression for output that you know will tell us unambiguously how output is going to move. And uh, and there is a way to do that. Uh, so it's unclear from the eddy curve. So we need to take a different approach. But just because what I mean is, is that output, uh, if you read it of the aggregate demand curve, so you know that it's going to be key epsilon one plus tau x epsilon minus one, mu over p. And so we know that this here goes up, so that tends to lead to lower output, but we know that this like mu or key, one of the two goes up. And so it's not clear, you know, what dominates. So we've got to do a bit of thinking and like use different equations to actually figure out from the other results what happens to output. Uh, okay, and so in fact, what we are going to use is uh, is one of our solution equation. Uh, 
Um, so once on the labor market, once we had reshuffled um, our labor demand and labor supply, uh, what we had seen is that we had these equations that we had called L, uh, L for labor market, that was saying that uh, F, of, F of X, and this again, so you have to go back uh, you have to go back to the derivation of the solution of the model. And we had gotten that equation uh, that, in fact, we had used to get the XL, this XL function that we have here. That came from an equation that looked like this, that we had called L, that was Fx is equal to W over P divided by A alpha h1 minus alpha, f hat of theta 1 minus alpha, 1 plus tau hat of theta alpha. Okay, and so this we can actually rewrite it as follows. So we can write this as uh, f of x, times A, so here I'm bringing A that was on the right hand side to the left hand side, uh, times alpha, again alpha moves uh, sides, times uh, F hat of theta times H divided by one plus tau hat of theta to the power of alpha. So one plus tau of theta alpha that come from the right to the left hand side, f hat of theta alpha, same thing, h alpha, same thing. And so what's left is w, what's left on the right hand side is w over p, f hat of theta times h. Okay, so here I've just moved things, uh, I've just moved things around. Okay, so now here, what do we have? So here we can see a lot of things. So F hat of theta H, uh, that's just employment L. You know, this is just the aggregate supply, but that's just, uh, the labor supply this is just equal to employment when we solve the model. Here, this F hat of theta L, F hat, F hat of theta H, that's just L. Once you divide it by one plus tau of theta, that's just N. So this is just f of x a and alpha. And so this is just f of x a and alpha. That's just f of x times k the capacity. Uh, and that's just uh, basically our aggregate supply. So that's just output, actually. So we've made output appear here. So if I re so here I'm just reworking that condition L uh, in a way that will allow me to see what happens to output. So here what I get is that alpha y is equal to w over p times l. And so actually that, uh, that has a, a very natural interpretation, this equation. What is this saying? This is saying that the labor share, oops, this is saying that the labor share is equal to alpha in the model. Uh, this is a very simple interpretation because the labor share is uh, labor income divided by total income. And labor income, well, that's um, all, that's a real wage that you pay all your workers, so W over P. Uh, time. Well, I mean, I guess you can also say it. Let's think in nominal terms just to bring even more intuition. Labor income is nominal wage times L, L number of worker, W their wage. Total income, well, it's P. Oh, God. Uh, it's P, the price of services times Y, the number of services. So labor share is just uh, W over L divided by uh, P times Y. And so you can see that this equation just says that W over L divided by P times Y is equal to alpha. That's what we learn here. So this equation, just which we obtain by reshuffling the labor demand is equal to labor supply, just says that the labor share is equal to alpha. But this equation will allow us to see what happens to, uh, what happens to output because 
Here, with a positive aggregate dimension, we know that employment goes up. Real wage doesn't change. And so, you know, it has to be that output goes up. Because if employment goes up with the same real wage, the labor income goes up. But the labor share is constant, so output has to go up. Okay? Uh, so actually, from this, we see that output goes up. And so this, com this completes our uh, comparative statics here. Uh, what we learn is that y, uh, y goes up. Uh, so, so after a positive aggregate dimension, everything goes up. You have tighter labor market, tighter product market, more employment, more output. Okay. Um, and of course, with then an impact on all the other variables that on all the trading probabilities that depend directly on uh, that depend directly on the tightnesses. We know what's going to happen here. They all, you know, they move accordingly. Um, so that's our aggregate demand shock. Uh, and the mechanism is that more demand means tighter product market means a higher selling probability means a stimulated labor demand means you know, higher labor market tightness, and that means, uh, of course, uh, higher employment. And, and, you know, if we think about uh, unemployment and idleness, so unemployment, when you have a positive aggregate demand shock, unemployment or the unemployment rate, uh, which is, you know, the unemployment rate is just one minus F hat of theta, that clearly goes down. So when you have a positive aggregate demand shock, you have less unemployment uh, and the idleness rate which is just one minus f of x um, f of x that's also going to um, go down and so conversely you know the employment rate um, goes up and the utilization rate or selling probability also goes up but when you have a positive aggregate demand shock you have less slack on the labor market and you also have less slack on uh, on the product market. So positive aggregate demand reduces slacks on both market. Um, you know, I mean, we, we showed positive aggregate demand job leads to tighter market, so less slack. Uh, so that's, uh, you know, that's interesting. And of course, a negative aggregate demand shock is exact opposite. It leads to more slack uh, on both market. So that's what it is. So now we'll, let's look at other types of shock and we'll see that actually they'll have um, very different effects. Um, so then we'll be able to look at the correlation between tightnesses and quantities in the real world to separate between uh, types of shocks.